He was the former coordinator of the Northern <laughs> Great Plains Migratory Bird Joint Venture. And uh, so today he's going to talk about, I think, some of that work, the challenges of grassland bird conservation. So thank you, Dan, for being here tonight. Working? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming, folks. Um, I am going to speak a little bit about, or mostly about, what some of the approaches I've taken in my previous position, but a little bit more generally about grassland and bird concerns. And uh, just to be a little bit of an advocate for, you know, we love the birds that we see in Northwest Montana, but Monta Montana really is one of the uh, most important places for grassland birds on the continent. And so I just want to talk a little bit about that as well. So hopefully everything will work here. Um, this is a scene in the Muscle Shell Plains, and I'm going to get back to that area at the end of my talk. This is uh, north and west of Roundup. That's the little snowy mountains in the background, some of the best grassland in the state. Uh, some of you probably heard over the last uh, uh, five years or so the report about Cornell and Partners in Flight that we've lost more than 3 million birds continentally. Uh, since 1970. That's just coming up with population estimates and looking at the trends of all those bird populations. And um, it, it goes across all groups. Forest birds have declined, uh, shorebirds have declined, but grasslands have declined most steeply of any sort of suite of bird species um, in North America with uh, 720 million birds lost. And, uh, and this 53% uh, population loss in grassland birds. That's across the board, and a lot of species have lost more than that. And I'll show you some examples of that. If you look at uh, this map, was done by laying the, the range maps of a whole a variety of grassland dependent birds, everything from uh, grassland raptors to game birds to sparrows and a few shorebirds and things that nest in the, in the prairies. And you can see that uh, eastern Montana and the western Dakotas and southern prairie provinces is some of the highest uh, diversity of grassland and birds. It's really the key area for grassland and birds breeding area um, in North America. And then in the winter, a lot of the important areas are actually in Mexico where habitat changes even more pronounced than it is in the breeding range. But um, a lot of the birds that have been declining are birds that, that we think of as common birds. Western meadowlarks have shown dramatic declines. Corned larks, which is an abundant bird. And the good thing is a lot of these birds are shown steep declines, but they're actually still fairly common. And in some cases, it's still abundant, but the, the population is declining nevertheless. Uh, burrowing owls. Um, and then there are a number of birds that we don't think of necessarily as grassland birds. There's a handful of shorebirds that nest in grassland, like this marble godwit, and uh, a number of ducks that are really grassland birds as far as nesting goes, pintails being a good example. So um, when I was working in the, as a joint venture coordinator, we sort of identified some priorities. We focused on those birds where we had a fairly high percentage of their range and where they, they had shown some pretty substantial decline. So we have a pretty good stewardship responsibility. And we are one of the areas where we have some chance of making a difference in the populations. Loggerhead shrike is one we considered. We didn't advance that all the way through the tools that we built, but it's a good example. There's one that's declined 77% since the 70s. So when I was working for the joint venture, this is the landscape that uh, I was working in. I was out of Billings, but um, an area of southeastern Montana, the western Dakotas. And you can see this is sort of a cover type map. You can see that this is a grassland area. And then sort of the uh, Powder River Basin and Thunder Basin grasslands in northeastern Wyoming. This joint venture, the Northern Great Plains JV, is one of uh, more than 20 that covered the continent. And uh, the joint ventures were originally established to restore waterfowl populations and help deliver the North American Wetland Conservation Act, which is large scale, million dollars at a time, big projects to restore wetlands and associated uplands to bring back waterfowl populations, which had undergone really steep declines in the 70s. Um, and that model was so successful of bringing people together at the table to work on a, a group of birds that these joint ventures popped up all over the country as an approach. Uh, to doing conservation for birds in need. In my particular joint venture, I was working for Ducks Unlimited, but put a real emphasis on other grassland birds um, just because of that stewardship responsibility and the fact that we're right in the core of a number of those, those species ranges. So the joint ventures were to build healthy roads for birds and to work on landscape uh, level work. 
uh, nonpartisan, uh, non-regulatory are a big part of this. In fact, the whole idea behind the joint ventures was to work in partnership in a non-regulatory way to bring about positive habitat change. In my own joint venture, uh, I answered to a board of directors. This is part of that board. And you can see the diversity of, of uh, entities that were on my management board, everything from government agencies to nonprofits um, to um, you know, state and federal agencies. Uh, just a nice variety of people with a common interest in, in protecting and preserving and addressing the birds and habitats. So that board came together and we set up a set of ecological and active and uh, education objectives. Uh, as far as birds went, as far as ecological objectives, you know, we wanted to bring bird populations up and we wanted to work on water quality, quantity, healthy soils, diverse wildlife, and most importantly, increasing amounts of grassland on the landscape that had the right sort of species mix of grasses. Um, basically, we wanted to say, let's have no net loss of function of grassland if we can get to that. Now, as I said, there's a whole bunch of birds that depend on grasslands, everything from long billed curlews to Wilson's fallow, to draw this little wetland bird, but then these little ephemeral wetlands scattered across the, the, the grasslands, northern pintail, the mountain plover, and the, the arid end of things uh, down there. The mountain plover, you know, that's sort of a prairie dog specialist, has really short grass. And then there, in Montana, especially, there's a lot of sagebrush step next to more grasslands. It's kind of not a Traditional, just like you think, just pure grass. It's sort of everything from pure grass to very uh, dense uh, sagebrush. But we focused on a suite of birds. As I mentioned, uh, uh, basically we had 20% or more of their population within our geography, and they've shown uh, drastic declines. And so these were the ones that we some, built some decision support models for, basically, did some particular research and education around them. And they're the chestnut colored long spur, Baird's sparrow, formerly McCown's long spur, now called thick billed long spur, terrible name. I thought it should have been named the Bay Wing long spur, Sprague's pippet, and Mark Bunny. So, uh, thick billed uh, long spur has decreased by 91% since the beginning of the breeding bird survey. Pretty dramatic, still abundant in certain places, and we'll get back to that later, but uh, certainly some real concern there. And the whole idea behind what we did and one of the selling points of what we did as a joint venture and what the bird conservation community does as a whole is emphasizing we want to keep common birds common. There's, there's always the idea that you use a carrot or a stick to incentivize conservation. Well, you don't want to get these birds onto the endangered species list. That carries with so much political baggage. Um, and so that's part of the selling point that we need to use for talking about this. We're trying to prevent them getting to the point where they get listed. Chestnut collared long spur, 86% declines, bark bunning, 4%, sprays pivot, 80%, fair sparrow, 75%. So you can see these are all birds that over time have, have really declined. And there's a number of factors involved. Like all uh, small land birds, they, they have problems with window strikes and maybe with wind and certain loss of migratory habitat and significant losses on their, their wintering habitat. As I mentioned in Mexico, where a lot of grassland is being converted into pivot agriculture, potato fields. Um, so they're really losing habitat at both ends, but they've lost in North America, uh, in, the, in the US and Canada, they've also lost a lot of their breeding range. I'll show you some of that as we get moving forward. So we think of the Eastern Montana prairies and there's a lot of values and there's a lot of pressures on it. Uh, a lot of the public land is used for hunting. Um, we think of it as antelope country. Um, there's you know, mounting pressures for energy development, be it oil, be it wind. But really a primary land is one that's really critical to the ongoing success of these populations of grassland birds is that really uh, livestock uh, production is a major um, land use and is very compatible with the needs of many of these birds. And so a lot of what we did in my job with the joint venture was to work to work with ranchers to facilitate successful models for how they could build and maintain their grass resource in ways that was compatible with keeping the right side up, basically. So if you think about the decision that a, a person who owns a, a thousand acres of prairie is faced with, it's either raise cattle or go into agriculture, growing something. Right? Then you turn over the soil and they don't ever really get made for coming back. So a lot of our effort was really aimed at keeping ranching in the land. Conversion is really the biggest threat to that. 
most of that conversion is to row crop agriculture. As far as habitats go um, that support these birds, if you think about bird habitats, um, you know, a lot of most, obviously most agricultural land is, is private. So the green bars are private. Forest, boreal forest especially is a lot of public land. Western forest is a lot of public land. A lot of rangeland in the West and BLM is public land. But when you look at grasslands, it's primarily uh, private lands. So dealing with the private land issue, private land managers making their own decisions about how they manage the landscape and how can they play a role in those decisions. As I mentioned, you know, we want voluntary ways of getting things done. We have to really frame producers as, as conservationists. These are the people that are making conservation decisions on the landscape, the whole idea of keeping common birds coming. And so a lot of what we work together in the partnership for is to um, keep ranching on the land and that sustainable land use, in this case, sustainable livestock production in sustainable communities. And really, there's not too many alternatives to that in a lot of these landscapes. So we spent a lot of time thinking about how can we leverage the farm bill, um, which is billions of dollars per year going to agricultural efforts. And a lot of that's in the conservation domain. So hundreds of millions of dollars every year available to, to do things like conservation reserve program, which would be plants and over the lands, like uh, wetland protection, uh, riparian corridors. There's a whole number of different conservation programs that have the farm bill that we could help inform and try to steer to the places where we're going to have the most good for these grass and birds. So we worked a lot with the, the Natural Resource Conservation Service and the local conservation districts. So part of what I did at the end of my career um, in this JV position was I put together a conservation roadshow which was we went out to conservation districts or the local boards within the county uh, that sort of regulate the erosion control grants that work with farmers and different programs. And uh, in a lot of the NRCS effort, the local effort from the Natural Resources Conservation Service is through those conservation districts. And when they have new programs and they have developed some progressive new programs to, to reach out on resource issues. Um, and so people at the county level that are making those decisions. So I, I traveled, I went to uh, 68 counties in the joint venture. I knocked off all the counties in Montana and most of the ones that were told us before I retired. Where I went to the, the local meetings and talked, introduced the joint venture. Most people have never heard of the joint venture. Uh, I tried to work about how can we inform conservation and talk about the value of birds and give them some examples of the kinds of projects we could help to fund. And so part of the thing with grassland birds is that when we think of managing for a bird or a, an animal, any wildlife species that's declining, we think what kind, what does the habitat it needs look like? And how do we make that kind of a habitat? And if we can make that kind of habitat, we can have more of that species. The problem in grassland but, uh, is that there's so many variables affecting the health and the structure of grassland year to year. If you think of what a drought does to a grassland habitat. The single point on the ground, you might be trying to manage for lush grass, but you just flat out can't do it when you drive in. You have to consider livestock as well. You have to consider what you can utilize for your for your cattle. And so the important message, one important message I brought forth in those meetings was we just want intact grassland. These birds, luckily, most of these birds evolved in an you know, environment where there was roaming herds of bison. And so for birds that are dependent, and this is a sort of a continuum here from very short grass, almost a lot of bare ground, up to, you know, woody cover and things. Uh, McCown's Longsburg really likes this, this level. So it, back when it was bison roaming the prairie, it probably moved to the places where the bison had been most recently, where the grass was the shortest. And then for the next year, that the bison hadn't been there, maybe that's lush and it goes down to a different place. So these birds are sort of nomadic by nature. They will find the habitat that suits them. But the problem is, if you start having less habitat available as a whole across their range, they don't have that flexibility. So really part of our philosophy was we just want to keep as much intact grass on the landscape as we can. And then we want to help any individual producer um, manage his grass in a way that he can provide for some suite of these species on any given point in time. And a lot of the, the ranchers have moved into high intensity, short duration grazing, which actually sort of imitates what bison is. So you have you hit a pasture and you hit it really hard. And the grasses are also adapted to this, oddly enough. It seems like things are almost all connected. Um, they'll recover really well, but you don't hit them again for a year or six months. 
Um, and so that's part of the, the type of management. A lot of guys historically just were sort of year round basin. So that's never a chance to recover. So we went into that a little bit more detail in this conservation virtual people. But, but then I said, well, we have various tools. There's been a lot of different models developed from the breeding bird survey, from eBird, from other things to identify core areas for these birds. And so this again is a map of the joint venture showing all the counties and showing sort of the hot spots for chestnut colored longspur. So we want to try to focus our efforts for that species in those places. And uh, this is a bird. This is a bird that likes fairly short grass. This is again the mussel shell plains. I'm going to talk about mussel shell plains a lot um, south of the snowy mountains there. So this is uh, north of Harleton and Rygate, west of Roundup, south of Lewistown on the other side of the mountains. This is the type of stuff they like sort of level to rolling mixed grass prairie, short grass, very open, very few shrubs, um, and low dense litter. So this again would be sort of you can you can graze a place pretty heavily and, and maintain. Just in color long stars. The other end of the, of the spectrum, here's Baird Sparrow, another one of our uh, birds of concern. Again, you can see the breeding and winter range up here on the right. Uh, and again, we have models that say some of the hot spots here. And just to orient you to the map, this is the this is Montana here. So this is the southeast corner of Montana right here. So this is the area where uh, Lend Circle and uh, to these very over the muscle shell plane came up here. Uh, so in contrast to the longspurs, these guys like uh, idled grasslands. So they like, you know, up to a meter tall grass. Native or tame structure is more important than species. So again, not really prescriptive. It's just that within a rotation system, you might be able to have, uh, have both of these species. And indeed, I worked with uh, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies on a ranch, the trapping bear sparrows and grasshopper sparrows. And in one quarter section, 160 acre pasture, there were chestnut colored longspurs, bears, sparrows, and bobolinks, all within that same pasture. It was just that the bobolinks were down in the wet spots at the bottom. These guys were <clears throat> in the mid grass where it hadn't been raised recently, and then up on the hilltop where the you know, settler soils were shallow, where there were chestnut colored longspurs. So, again, the idea is just to have as much grass as possible so you can have those ideal uh, conditions. So, when we talked about developing objectives for action, we want landowners to adopt diverse conservation practices and practices, and we want to provide incentives for them to do that and to communicate enough with them and work closely enough with the ranching community because it's really the respected members of any local community that are going to have the most pull when they talk about what's going to work for birds, what's going to work for their cattle, and, uh, and then trying to build within agencies, and especially the federal government and within the NRCS to develop programs to make money available to help uh, implement practices. This is at a ranch in South Central South Dakota, uh, where this guy now, again, it's a very, uh, you know, they have hard winters there. This guy has managed his grass resource enough that he can raise his cattle year round in a rotational basis. He doesn't have to buy hay. Um, he's raising organic beef for a specialized market. Um, and it just really can be done with enough attention to the landscape. And, and again, he had a place where he had Bears and sparrows are uh, doing really well. So we try to decide how can we as a partnership, and when I talk about the joint venture, I should mention that for most of my time at the joint venture, the staff of the joint venture was me. It's to that board, but it was a broad partnership of other people that I worked with to get them as well. Um, so what we tried to do is develop some, oops, Develop some, some conservation design tools that sort of might help steer where on the landscape we could work. And here's another good example of that buried landscape that, that would have, you know, maybe buried sparrows and some of this uh, blue bunch wheatgrass and then on the ridge tops, maybe sparrows, tippets, and things. Uh, develop those species models like I showed you, and then do this conservation roadshow, get the word out, and to get feedback from people. What do they need most? What are they most concerned about other than predators? Because you did hear that. Um, and then building a conservation delivery network, because really what it takes to get these things done is to have funding and then have people to put that funding out into the ground. And so unless you have bodies, and that's the trick when you're writing grants is to get bodies. People want to, they said, if we give you a certain amount, what can you get done? So like, well, if we put these higher people, we can get a lot done. So that was to try to build that conservation delivery network, which is really one of our objectives. So as I said, we, we, our decision really was to acknowledge that conservation decisions were really made at the local level 
Um, in our joint venture, 68 counties, 83% of that intact rangeland. So really, uh, when I told you all those declines, a lot of those species, like the declines I showed you, that was range one. A lot of those are actually doing fairly well within the joint venture. So we still have pretty healthy populations of some of those grass and birds because we do have a mostly intact landscape. So how can we you know, work on those declines and still provide the other amenities that we want from the landscape? And so part of that is to identify the most important places, to put monitoring in place if we can, and, uh, and then we'll develop these win -win solutions. And so things like the three, the three primary tools we were talking about working on rangeland habitat are to restore by reseeding places that have been tilled, trying to bring them back into the right kind of structure that we need for these birds. We can't really make it native prairie we can get close. Improved management flexibility, which is how we can enhance the landscape. And that really is what we measure for the uh, providing water to parts of the pasture that otherwise you couldn't get the cows to go there. So they can move them across the landscape, uh, providing fencing where it's needed to provide more rotation and places for the grazing programs. And then lastly, keeping grasslands intact, and that's protecting them. So that's putting in conservation easements or actually purchasing land. But really focus more on the first two. But so one of the ideas we said, how, for, those are the three tools we want to work with. How can we come up with a way to do that? And again, we have these species models, so we can help direct where we go based on one of those species models. Um, but there are other tools, and one of my major partners was World Wildlife Fund with their iconic critter of the prairies, the uh, panda. They have a great plains program out of Bozeman, really a progressive program that's well-funded. Um, doing a lot of work with Kevin Ellison, he now works with the American Bird Conservancy, but he was doing bird surveys on 60 ranches across this landscape, directly outreaching people, helping people understand these are the birds on your place, what kind of tools can they provide. Um, he did the road shows with me a lot, and they've done some, some modeling to show um, where you get the most, where you're going to build the biggest blocks of habitat. So if you're going to restore habitat, you want to do it, if you just restore a, a 40 acre parcel in the middle of a giant meat field, that's not going to meet the needs of Birds. They want the landscape that's mostly intact. So they did some modeling that showed you um, where you would get the most bang for your buck, uh, restoring it. And then they, one of the tools they developed was called their plow print analysis. And what they did is on an annual basis, <coughs> they looked at the uh, crop data layer and mapped you know, in GIS, here's all of the tilled land. Here's all the places that have been broken. And they did that on an annual basis to look at rate of change, but it was a cumulative map. So over time, if a, if a parcel was broken, it stayed in the cloud. So in this map, the brown is, is land that's been broken, and the green is, is intact region. And again, you can see this joint venture fell right in here, all this nice stuff. So some of the best prairie in North America is here, especially in northwestern uh, South Dakota, and in uh, southeastern and south and central of Montana. And, uh, and so then they could do sort of an either or on the cloud print, and then we can analyze within that. We can overlay that with species models. And so we have a lot of tools to try to put together where do we want to focus our efforts. So we used it uh, in a couple of ways. One was a measure of net landscape change. So one of the expectations from the Fish and Wildlife Service, who provides the funding for all of the joint ventures, uh, is that they will serve sort of as a bookkeeper for how much functional habitat is in your landscape. So we want these joint ventures to set objectives and say, you know, what are you gaining? You know, what was the net change in the landscape from year to year? We didn't really have the capability to do that. You know, frankly, there was a lot of wild ass guesses um, because it's just not that easy to say. Uh, you can look at a particular program and say maybe so much restoration happened, but you don't have another way of saying how much was broken up. Uh, and on and on, every program sometimes you know, the same piece of land has been, has had several different practices put on this. Tough to track. The plow print really gave us a little bit of a sort of a 100,000 foot level look at sort of that net landscape change. And then again, we tried to come up with a way that we could use it to say how much opportunity is there uh, county by county and where is that opportunity to deliver these conservation programs. And so the last roadshow uh, efforts that are made within the last states to show COVID, which is South Dakota. I actually went to South Dakota during COVID. We hadn't hit there yet. And it gave some presentations with the mask. But so forgive me that I don't have Montana counties in this presentation, but um, you get the idea. So what, this was an area, a five county area that uh, we, through my efforts, uh, the, NRC, the state office of the NRCS 
put together a grassland program that made um, uh, about a million dollars a year available to ranchers uh, to do some of the grassland things that we were talking about. And so within that area, looking at the plow print, this just shows you sort of, again, the green, the green is the intact rangeland and the orange is the plow print and then the purple is perennial cover in formerly uh, tilled area. So in any given year, um, generally, the orange stuff here would be, say, wheat fields uh, that were tilled manually, and the, some of the, the purple would be maybe CRP or alfalfa fields that were perennial. They had been plowed, but they were perennial cover. And uh, when I give these maps in the meetings, people, oh, yeah, but that's Dave's place right there. <laughs> He's got a, a, but I tried to indicate, well, look, we're not using this to say, here's, here's the parcel that we want to work on right here, just to give us an idea of what the opportunity was in the county. So here's the philosophy we went into this uh, with, is that if we look at the plow print, we have um, three, three cover types basically breaking it down. So one is intact range land, one is perennial cover in formerly tilled land, and then one is this annually tilled land. So if, like I mentioned restoration enhancement and protection is our three conservation strategies. So if a person is making a decision to do something on the land, they're going to be most likely to want to restore land. It, let's look in that top row. If they're working with taking crop out of rotation and cover, putting it into perennial cover, they're probably going to want to do that on the poorest soils. They don't want to give up their, their highly productive soils and put them in. So there's going to still be dedicated cropland up there. So this is sort of the cell in this matrix. If you look at the, the soil types and the cover types, that's where we want to focus our restoration efforts. As far as a perennial uh, cover informally, tilled land, the best opportunity to keep someone, say, from wanting to turn this perennial cover back into annual cover is if we could enhance this, maybe we put in fencing, maybe he'd like to go back to grazing that land or start working towards restoring it, uh, restoring the species mix in it. But he can't do that unless he gets some more water or some more fencing in the landscape, some, some resources. So that's where we want to put the enhancing, because he's not likely to till the more that less productive and then lastly, intact rangeland, if it's intact, uh, the stuff that's most at threat, of course, is going to be if it's under like good soils adjacent to existing corn fields or, or soybean fields or whatever. And so if we have only so many dollars to put into to protecting this intact land, it's more likely to keep raising the poor soils and more likely to, to till the good soils. So what we did then is we took this model and we applied it to um, all of the joint venture counties in each of the four states, and then also each of the counties. So in South Dakota, the vast majority of the landscape is intact grazing lands on poor soils. So that's not at very high risk. We want to just help work with managing grazing in those places. But we might have an opportunity in some of that intact range with over 600,000 acres. This is the stuff that's likely to get plowed next. Maybe that's where we want to put some efforts to protect that. And here we want to maybe enhance this as a perennial cover, um, some opportunity there. And then out of the uh, basically 2.8 million acres of cropland, more than half of it is on poor soils. And so that's a really good opportunity. We can identify where those one and a half million acres are. That's sort of the level of opportunity. I'm showing these to the state office in, in South Dakota is what made them build this new grassland protection program. This new grassland conservation program, because we want to say, look at all the opportunity that exists there. It's going to be within the management scheme of the rancher to begin with. He's got his landscape, and he's already trying to decide, what do I want to do? Do I want to restore it or do I want to enhance How do I want to do it? And then on top of that, there's a CRP is this program to, to put cover, permanent cover on erodible soil and cloud. And it's a big program. It's a big conservation program, but it has a time limit. And a lot of uh, expiring contracts. And when we did this in 2017, there was a quarter million acres of CRP that was coming out of contract. And so that guy's now going to decide what am I doing with that land next? And so that's another opportunity that's out there is to get him to sign another contract and maybe think about enhancing it. Uh, maybe he wants to use it as raising land, but he can't do it again because he doesn't have the right amount of fence on it. So we can put in a fence up for him. Then it can stay intact and plow it again. 
And so we did that again. And I, when I did this roadshow, I did this for each county. We put together these summary tables and I built an online tool that the joint venture is on the joint venture's website now, where you can say, okay, um, you can search by county and then develop a report for the state um, or the county or both. And uh, it just gives you an idea. Well, here's the county, here's the population of the county, here's the percent private. In this particular county was a, a uh, was in preservation and um, the number of beef cows is a measure of sort of how much livestock stuff there is and CRP and, and how much is expiring by year and then the acres in those various categories are taken. Just to give a snapshot once again of what the opportunity is. And then we could look across all the counties and say, okay, well here's where we want to put our efforts, where is the, the best opportunity to buy? And no reason to worry about the individual numbers in this table. But uh, again, you can see that High percentages of private land, mostly intact, but the amount of opportunity as we defined it very well at the county too. So again, that only is going to get done if there's people on the landscape to do it. Luckily, there's a lot of different organizations and agencies that have people either as part of their job already in permanent staff positions with government agencies or uh, in uh, temporary positions in, in profits or permanent positions. So in the landscape that I was working in, we had anything from the Fish and Wildlife Service and various uh, bird conservancies to the Pheasants Forever, Ducks Unlimited, private lands biologists that work for the various state agencies, and they're delivering a number of things, a farm bill program, sagegrass initiative, or state programs, Habitat for Montana, for example, um, and then Fish and Wildlife Service, and then we developed what we call the um, Northern Grasslands Restoration Incentives Program based on a similar model that was really successful in Texas to help fund programs or fund uh, projects. So we didn't have a lot of money as a funding uh, partner, but we did get some money from Concord Phillips and from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation <coughs> and some partners and flight grants, excuse me, from the, from the Fish and Wildlife Service that we put into a pot, came up with some criteria. Um, were you in one of the priority areas we identified? What were you proposing to do? How would it get delivered, et cetera? And uh, so we started funding programs, and a lot of them really just look like what ranchers want to be doing on their landscape, but just don't have the pockets. You know, a lot of ranchers are land rich, you know, but not necessarily money rich. And, and really, what uh, you know, the, the most enlightened ranchers that we've worked with consider themselves grass farmers. I'm a grass farmer, I use cows as part of my management effort and then luckily I also get money back for those cows. Um, so a lot of what we did was to fund uh, solar panels uh, that, would, that would help run uh, watering stations and the pastures again so it increases flexibility to be able to move cattle across the landscape. Um, we had partner biologists at the time that I put this map together all of these dots were people that were working in local communities to deliver these kinds of programs. And so it really is a, a pretty good army of people doing it. A lot of these are people who are just coming out of school, they take a position, and they're really looking for a permanent job elsewhere. And so one of the problems with this program was getting someone to go to a place like Lynn, Montana, and want to live there for 10 years and really become a known entity in that community. And so really the, the ideal hires for these kind of jobs are someone who's close to retirement and wants to go back to a place that they love or someone who's from that community and wants to stay there, but have to be able to have a, a job other than just taking over the dad's farm. Um, but a lot of what we did was these kind of these watering features. Um, and uh, we had, you know, it wasn't a lot of money uh, in the first, in 2020, when we started this up, and, you know, we had a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, we tried to find matching funds. And a lot of what it's for is raising infrastructure with water or seeding. And uh, our objective was sixteen thousand acres, and we were defined on meeting those objectives. So there's a lot of demand out there, and of course, a lot of these guys are now the challenge of, of ranching and drought conditions really do need some help if they want to keep going. And uh, and another thing that's a really a key part in the ranching community is the succession. Um, not all that many young people want to take over the ranch, um, and so. And, and when they do, they don't necessarily have the capital or the herd to start a herd and split the, the pastures up. And so part of the effort, especially the wildlife, the wildlife is working on, was that very concept of ranch succession. What's it going to take for the next generation to still be able to ranch here? 
often that involves setting up new pastures and what we're doing. One of the examples I have here in front of you is that's the Auburn Ranch in Petroleum County. I actually ended up working really closely with the folks out of Bennett, Montana. A great little community of people doing all kinds of cool stuff there. The whole county has 500 people. It's the greater Bennett area. Um, but uh, there's some really progressive folks there. There's a guy uh, who lives down by Roundup who uh, has just really taken it and taken it as a responsibility to try to bring the ranching community together. And they started a little minute basis of the local community driven um, partnership to help ranchers, to help young ranchers, to, to supply local beef, local beef to the school system. Just great stuff. And the Algren's got in touch with us and we gave them $20,000 for a new water system. It helped open up uh, more than 3,500 acres of their ranch. And this is a ranch that has sage grounds and Baird sparrows and Spritz pickets and lots of the birds are concerned about. And ongoing bird monitoring through one of our other partners. A uh, similar project in Wyoming, uh, a, a grazing association that involves state land and federal land and private lands, uh, where we provided the funding for just a simple water feature that opened up another whole pasture. Uh, beginning of a 12,000 acre ranch, uh, a catalyst for more work. And that's one of the criteria we have in the projects that we funded is how is this going to serve to, to bring more conservation work to the landscape moving forward? And a nice variety of partners in that. And so we had a variety of things and some of them were kind of creative. One was uh, a project to just remove old windmills. In, in a lot of grassland habitat, vertical structure is detrimental to the birds because the raptors use them as perch, perch sets. And, uh, and so that structure doesn't need to be there, especially in places where there's grouse, that's a concern. Um, so we had one project that was a, 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 in Prairie County, Montana, when, when they removed the native receding, uh, you know, again, the types of things I've been talking about, like taking you know, into places like this and getting them back into common area, and moving some of these old windows and across the landscape. So the group I mentioned is Winnet Aces Agriculture Community Enhancement and Sustainability Group. It's uh, again in this very small community, but um, they have a conservation committee. I sat in it as, as one of my roles as a joint venture. They had over a quarter million dollars in grants from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, they developed a grassland banking project that's based part in part on what the Matador Ranch uh, south of Malta had been doing for the major conservancy. There's a 65,000 acre ranch there. I don't think anyone's ever been Zorton, not far from Zorton, Montana. And what they did is they built this grassland banking program where local ranchers could run their cattle on the Matador Ranch, but at a reduced uh, raising lease value compared to federal land. Uh, but in order to do that, they had to implement certain conservation practices on their own ranch. And it, it had its, its genesis a little bit in trying to get um, ranchers to accept having prairie dogs on their um, if they were willing to keep the prairie dogs on their ranch, they could get good grazing rights on this other ranch. And it was highly successful. They worked closely with the local community to help spawn this rancher stewardship alliance there. And we'll talk about them in a minute. And uh, just really built a lot of goodwill between the nonprofit that, in a lot of cases, um, people you know, have tended to think of all nonprofits that are conservation minded and being sort of ego owners. Um, yet, we're working very closely with the ranching community. There's still some hurdles to cross over there with the American Prairie Reserve. I'm not going to talk about them tonight, but they, they have some hurdles in that regard still. But um, anyway, these, this community, they, they're doing rangeland monitoring, um, really trying to show Bill Milton, the rancher that I mentioned out of Roundup, he's tried to bring people together in, from universities and nonprofits uh, to do all kinds of monitoring to really show is what we're doing making a difference in the landscape. Because that's what funders want to hear. Why are we spending? You know, why do Why do we have a quarter million from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation for things that we aren't really improving water, improving soil health, improving range condition, improving bird habitats? So they're really doing monitoring across the board, and a lot of regular meetings of community members to discuss how that's going. And I, one of the last things I did when I was there is I arranged a, a, a rangeland tour. We had a big bus. Um, we went to a couple of places all as a group, and then we split into small groups and went out to various ranches and invited all of our um, Senate and, and the Congress people and their staffers, greatly attended by those folks. But we had local politicians, uh, 
What's his name? The cowboy hat that does the prairie. Uh, it's on TV. The one that reported on it. It's escaping. Good coverage. Really great. And then at the end, we had a big barbecue. Everybody got together and just to have people talking across uh, all these levels and really allowing some ranchers to really share what their, their management concerns and challenges were as well. I mentioned the Ranchers Stewardship Alliance is another example of where people brought together data and this diverse group of people to pull together projects. And again, the projects kind of look like this, where they took expiring CRP and they put in a new water system and some new fencing. We're now able to manage that and let it um, become kind of just prairie grazing and, and start taking other distinct uh, steps, birding, reseeding, et cetera, to be able to try to bring the species mix back to its native. The National Fish and Wildlife Foundation has invested heavily in that, in that alliance, which is run by the ranchers. Permanently. And a lot of the work they did is, uh, again, they used the kind of models that I was showing you that show that this is, in, this is up in uh, North Valley in Phillips County, which is another one of the best uh, grassland areas in the state. Um, again, multiple species of priority in, in the red areas. Um, and a lot of the projects they funded are then falling within this map area for the birds and in sage grass core areas. And uh, at the time that I put this together, which was in 2019, uh, they had spent $1.5 million, uh, 600 of that coming from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, 932 coming from other sources, including the ranchers themselves. A lot of times the match is just the labor of the ranchers um, to impact you know, 21,000 acres in that area. So it's really partnership is the key to getting these things done. When we went around doing this conservation road show, we asked for feedback and asked for, are there some specific kinds of programs that we could build that would really help? One of the concerns is that a lot of the CRP that's out on the landscape and a lot of places that were planted as range enhancement back in the 50s and 60s uh, are crested wheat. And it ends up becoming this uh, sort of monoculture of crested wheat. And as it gets to this point, it's just not very nutritious and the guys can't graze it much and it's just kind of lost down to them. And so they really <clears throat> asked us to, to try to develop a project that's specifically aimed at taking whatever steps we needed to take crested wheat pastures and, and improve the structure, get some more forbs out there, uh, inspire and grazing and whatever combination we were able to try to do. CRP exploration enrollment, re enrollment is an ongoing issue. And uh, Montana started a new grassland CRP that specifically uh, rewarded those projects that use native mix, uh, which is more expensive and help subsidize the expense of that. Uh, there is more interest in restoration. You know, the other thing to think about native grasses is they are more resilient to drought than a lot of these exotic grasses. And uh, the message that I stuck in at the end of all of my talks was this idea of well-managed large blocks of habitat reduce both predation and invasive. Because invariably, after I gave this whole talk, one guy sitting in the corner with his arms crossed, well, it's predators is the problem, and weeds. And, you know, there's not enough money in the world for us to throw weed control. There's other people doing weed control. The part of us that in our job in the joint venture and in the bird conservation community is focused on things that are sort of in our wheelhouse. And the biggest argument about, about that that can be made is we are trying to have the largest possible well-managed blocks of grassland. And when you have that predators are less of an issue, there's less edge and there's less and invasives are less of an issue. There was some local interest in dealing with conifer encroachment. Um, there's a lot of uh, similar efforts been done for sage brush birds, sage grouse initiative, millions of dollars across the West to uh, fire control and water systems and marking fences and all the things that are needed to reduce um, mortality in sage grouse and improve conditions for sage grouse. And uh, a lot of work in, in that program has been removed. If you've seen any of these pictures that show an 80 year before and after in much of the Western range along Junipers have really moved out into uh, what was formerly safe brush habitat. And they get to a certain deflection point, you know, 20, 30 percent really cover, then the sage brush dependent birds no longer use the area. Um, we don't have as much of a problem with that in most of the northern Great Plains. There are some places in the, around the Montana, South Dakota border where Ponderosa Pine is doing a similar thing, and some juniper. Uh, 
some localized issue in that. And uh, uh, one of the, the important things, and we got this feedback from a lot of people at these meetings, because no one had done this before, going county to county. I mean, this is really going to the six or eight you know, people that are leaders in the local agricultural community. Um, that they were surprised that all of these people, including the panda, were interested in helping them do their job on the landscape. And, and really, this that's a movement in the conservation world is that unless you're working on the issues that are on working lands, whether it's timber lands or range lands, um, you're just not going to be successful. In, in private lands, conservation requires you to work closely with the people that are making a living off those lands. And luckily, as I said, in grasslands, and I have some similar things in, in work I did on ponderosa pine and snag nesting birds. There are things you can do that are very compatible with what the private landowner wants to do with their land, but also with the you know, habitat for those birds. So um, that's really what I, all I wanted to talk about as far as the program goes and what I was doing in the joint venture. And I found it really rewarding. And you know, it came on me by surprise. I had when I was working for American Bird Conservancy here in Kalispell. Um, for those that don't know, I worked here for 16 years for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and then for 15 years for the American Bird Conservancy. And when I was in that role, I was my title was the Northern Rockies Coordinator. I was working a lot on things like ponderosa pine and snag issues, but I had started working on long-billed curlews and grassland issues. <clears throat> We hired a gal, Cheryl Mandich, who lived in North Dakota and started doing some work, putting in some long with curlews and surveys and working with the folks at World Wildlife um, to sort of move into the direction that this ended up going. And uh, I went to meet with uh, Jeff Nelson, who was in that program in Bozeman, to talk about that long with curlew program and basically ended up walking away with a been recruited to apply for this job to be the Northern Great Plains Joint Venture Coordinator. And when I was 59 at the time, I was thinking I was getting close to retirement. I had no plans to leave from Summers to Billings. I knew this, but um, I thought, gosh, you know, I love the grassland. I haven't spent enough time up there. It's an important conservation issue, and it was really rewarding to me. But the thing I really did like about it is I traveled all over that landscape for the last six years. And so if you're on eBird, you know that I've been in every county in the state eating birding over those years. And um, it's easy enough here in northwestern Montana, as I said earlier in the talk, that we love the landscapes here, we love the lakes here in the lakes, and you know, we can live in the main part of the state. And, um, there's just such a subtle beauty. I really recommend that you, you get out and explore eastern Montana because it's a special place. And, uh, you know, there's just some really remarkable landscapes and a lot of really cool birds. And so uh, you know, I came away with a real love for the bird. And also, as I sat in all those conservation district meetings, God, I'll tell you what, 25 year old me said, there's no way I was going to sit in a room with those rancher guys and have any credibility or, or even, you know, be able to understand what it was they cared about. And it was just really meaningful to me to reach a point in my career where I was, you know, firm enough in what I was doing and confident enough that there was, there was mutual interest. But also learning just so much about those little communities. I mean, I never pictured living in a town like that. I mean, I probably still wouldn't really want to live in one of those small prairie towns, but the sense of community there is just it's so palpable. I was just really moved working with those folks. This is a site uh, that that was uh, that last one. This is Macomb County, uh, east of Glenda. The first one was up near uh, Westby. This one's east of Billings, about 30 miles, up the Steamboat Rocks and BLM. Uh, this one uh, is in Treasure County, I believe, north of Haitian, something that's safe for us to step or something. But the area that I really uh, developed a real love for in a place that I really think if you want to treat yourself to what grassland is going to really be like is this muscle shell plains area. So here's Harleton. This is Highway 12, White Sulphur Springs. So that this way is Helena. Coming down from uh, Lewis, oh, there's Lewistown. Coming down from Malton, you come down here. Down there. But this area here, south of the Snowy Mountains and north of the Muscle Shell River, uh, is some of the highest quality 
grassland anywhere and it has all of these birds or many of these birds that I've been talking about. So I really recommend if you want to enjoy grassland birds in their habitats to visit this area. Don't tell too many other people about it. There is some sagebrush there. It's a mixture. It's a place I also do a lot of antelope hunting. Um, so there are sage grouse there, and a lot of sage grouse uh, conservation efforts in that part of the world. But uh, the part about it that's really the nicest to me is a lot of the grasslands. And there's some there's some uh, prairie dog colonies with uh, the family group of burrowing owls I showed you was just north of Rygate. This is that cover shot that I showed you that I didn't figure out how to change my template. So it has this weird uh, laser strikes going on. But um, again, the little snowy mountains up there, and that's a shell would be the river would be behind me. This is a place I did some of the transects for the partnership group. This is directly south of the snowies off of what's called Waffle Road and some of the best. Uh, Sprague's pivot and McCowan's Longspur for Prairie Longspur habitat uh, in the state. This is Bob Forty as a National Park and Flight Coordinator. He went out with me a couple of years there. He's not really looking at that bird as fake print, but um, there are places there where you can stand and you can have 30 or 40 McCowan's Longspurs in their flight displays along the way. It's really spectacular. That's, that's one of these Longspurs. There are sprays pipettes uh, this year with the drought. It's that part of the state really was stricken with the drought in all of eastern and especially northeastern North Carolina. Drought, the sprays pipettes were down. Uh, but that's a great place for them. My friend Scott, who does a breeding bird survey there, he had I think uh, I think he might have had twenty at one stop, but he certainly had uh, the twenty on the route and the one shorter than all. So. They're very sporadic in their populations, but it's a good place for them. And it's a great place for long billed curlews, one of my favorite birds, and one that's still getting some attention. ABC still has a long billed curlew project where they're putting some of the money that the NRC has put together in present, specifically to target places where curlews are known to occur. They kind of like the middle of the scene for the present. And so if you have curlews here in the spot, it's likely to sometimes have long spurs and sometimes have the bigger spurs. Um, the other good news, and I mentioned some of these birds are doing well in this part of the world. Uh, shorter owl numbers are actually up. Uh, the numbers are up, although there's only about 130,000 of them total. And the largest short bird in the world. Uh, both the Rudinous Hawks and Swains and Hawk numbers are up, so they're actually doing okay. Uh, they still, you know, need large blocks of grasslands. Uh, I think are doing okay. Uh, Oakland sandpiper, which is really a curlew, uh, more closely related to the longbill curlew. So I jokingly call them short curlew curlews sometimes. This is a video, and I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure what to push to make. Just do the next video, the next slide. Yeah. Really fun bird. Um, lots of sparrows and, and closely related species. This is the, probably the most common sparrow species in Montana. You know what sparrow that is? Vesper sparrow. Eye ring on the chestnut shoulder patching is a white outer tail feathers you can't see here. But that's the most that, that bird is across a wide variety of, of habitats across the entire state. This is one that's uh, this is a grasshopper sparrow, and this is uh, much more common in eastern Montana. It's a rare bird. Um, 
Baird Sparrow, which is a, a much uh, lower frequency sound than what we usually hear. Curtain's just north of Arlington, just right out of town. Now, this is really kind of the, the mascot part of our joint venture because it was we really had the majority of the terrain within the boundaries of the joint venture just in front of the And it sounds like a distant metal bus. So that's it. I really urge you to get out to that part of the world and enjoy those birds. Um, lots of them are spectrum conferences. Um, you know, often these things finish with a bunch of website addresses. You don't need those anymore. All you need is Google. Um, but check out the websites. Uh, you know, the joint venture continues. The, the, the person who's in charge of the joint venture now is Catherine Whiteman. She's the in the state. She's really on the board. And she's the board. Very Potholes Joint Venture is a lot of similar work. They're more focused on wetlands because they're in the core of the, what they call the duck factory, but they do a lot of EPS and other work as well. World Wildlife Fund, their program in, uh, in Bozeman is doing great stuff. They do the plow print report every year. They, they print up stickers and say, let the prairies thank our nature. I'd like to see you. It's like they brought some if I still had stack them. But I don't. American Bird Conservancy, they're, they're still working actively in grassland. Bird Conservancy of the Rockies has pulled together a big summit that's, that's talking about grassland issues across the largest possible scale. It's ongoing. It's made and we have a big tree fad in Fort Collins that'll probably be mostly online, just unless things change more. Um, but one of the things that they're trying to work towards is something similar to that North American Wetlands Conservation Act that would provide large sums of money for grassland projects. Like million dollar chunks, major conservancy and major institution. All of these are really worth checking out. So thanks. Just wanted to share that there are good things going on with these birds. It's not all some of them. The last thing I didn't mention early on, put one little touch of it at the end is that one of the things they calculated from all the population work has been done is. The first time ever, several years ago, they came up with a half life for these populations. And things like chestnut collar longs, where the half life is like 12 years. So, in 12 years, we're going to have half as many as we have now. So, those declines are still really a major issue. And it's one of the major conservation concerns. But I think there's a lot of hope still for, for the prairies because a lot of organizations and entities are starting to focus on it. Thanks. I have one question. I have two questions. Um, you said that once you lose native grasslands, you can't get them back, but then this is all about restoration. So, how much are you? Restoring? Yeah, it's not all restoration. Well, part. Of it. Yeah, it, it's restoring um, something that approximates to cover the cover of the structure of native grasslands. The thing that I didn't show that I should have put in this is that, that prairie, native prairie is old growth, that the vast majority of the biomass is in the soil. These are plants that have deep, deep root systems and very complex soil. And so it takes a long, it's like, it's like cutting old growth forest. You know, you can't really create old growth. You can create the conditions to provide old growth in the distant future. But, um, so a lot of it's structural. So we, we're not naive enough to say, let's just plant native grass and we'll have native grass in 20 years. No, but we can plant a mixture of things that will emulate the structure that those birds do that will provide for the producer to still be in good productive food for his cattle as well. But the main thing is restoring permanent cover and it will be something that approximates native. And then just one other quick question, but is, the Great American Prairie, does that overlap some of this area? Uh, the American Prairie Reserve? Yeah. 
it does, yeah, it's mostly much so my joint venture ended at the Missouri River. Yeah. And most of the APR is in north of the Missouri. They have some south of the Missouri. But, and they're adjacent to that Matador Ranch of the TNC. And it's a good model, it's a visionary model. They, you know, the controversy about the APR is that just it's deeply ingrained in the one ranchers that you know, there's a problem with bison relative to their plan. And and they've been, you know, also moving towards more fencing, not less, because it allows them to do rotational grazing. And part of the concept of the APR is to get rid of the fences and not get you know, rid of the fences. So the, those are just sort of sticking the call some of the energy agreement. But you know, by the same token, it's willing sellers that are selling their land to be able to get fence. You know, they're not. It's not eminent domain. We're getting ranches that people have decided that either the kids don't want to ranch anymore or they're tired of trying to make the go of it and they're selling it for you. And they're doing great bird research for you know, an ecotourism. I mean, it's a cool concept. The question about the litter is how big is the litter? Do you know how much nutrients is going on down in Mexico or on the coastline? It is and it isn't. Um, so it's mostly central Chihu the Chihuahuan grasslands, central Mexico. Um, uh, the uh, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies has had people down there, and American Bird Conservancy both have had people down there doing work and uh, doing, you know, doing mostly <clears throat> biological work, you know, marking birds, figuring out how much territory they're in. How, um, how key they are into specific sites. You know, is there more sensitivity in the winter than there is in the great winter? Um, but they're quantifying the loss of habitat, and it's scary. I mean, it really is. So one of the things that, that one of the questions I often got in my job was, well, if, you know, if there's such an issue in the winter in ranches, it matter what I do. It's like, well, I mean, a critical part of the life cycle of these birds is to breed. You know, if they you don't have a place to breed, it's irrelevant. So we have to fight it at both ends, but. There are there are challenges for sure. It's hard to send money to Mexico. And harder under some recent administrations. But yeah, no, it's a problem. Um, the, the, the photos, the, the aerial imagery is striking over the last couple of decades. Carol, Carol asked online, um, how many people would participate in the joint venture meetings and what kind of comments did you receive? Yeah, so the, um, those traveling meetings that I did, it varied from six to 20. And uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm, really. I was happy. I thought there would be more skepticism. Uh, and I realized that part of my job was to be a bit of a salesman to say, look, you know, so you understand, we're not just an outsiders that think we should tell you what to do. It's, hey, I'm here to tell you that we have a similar interest that you do. In, but there was, you know, there was some pushback. Um, there was comments like what I just said about winter range. So uh, they're losing winter range because they, I mean, a couple of people, and I didn't really mention winter range much in the call, but they looked at the map and said, oh, look, you know, it's wintering in Mexico. What's going on there? Um, and then, you know, I got some of the predictable comments about predators and, and um, but. Um, you know, I think a lot of ranchers feel like their voice has not been heard. And so there was a lot of positive feedback of like, wow, people are paying attention to what it is we do and, and think that actually they, they realize that we are conservationists because there's a lot of pride in, in much of the ranching community that they are stewards of the land. And they are, but you know, there's challenges. So. Yeah. Support these ranchers. Is there some type of labeling program, or where did a lot of these ranchers come from? Uh, that's a good question. I don't. I don't know if any. I'm sure there are places here where you can buy Montana grass-fed beef. But buying, but buying Montana grass-fed beef would be one way to. to Potentially supports absolutely this effort. Okay. absolutely yeah you know it, it is interesting because in the grand scheme of things you know even world wildlife they have some internal politics 
of an issue because at the global scale, in some of the world wildlife messaging was the best thing you can do for the is stop eating beef. And yet they have a great plains program that's all about <laughs> supporting the ranchers. And and you know, I certainly have the key thing about that is people are eating beef that's being raised in clear rainforests. Clearly, that's that's a negative impact, right? And you know, people will say, well, about the methane, you know, that's a greenhouse gas. And, but really, the, the net of, of not turn, not plowing the land and raising is definitely a carbon, a positive carbon. Once you release that carbon by plowing it up, it's a, it's a really good. So, eating beef that's that's grown on these, it, it's the biggest hope for these grasslands. I mean, if, if we get rid of beef, you know, especially if you, if you still want to eat something that looks like beef, and so you're eating soy bread. Now you're eating something that is the exact opposite of what these grasslands are actually eating. They tore up grasslands and burned soil. So, I mean, you know, face it, we're all doing it. What's happening? Anyway, thanks. I, I really like that job. It was not something I anticipated at the end of my career. It was just rewarding, and uh, I really did enjoy it. I just got tired of having a job, not that. Job. <laughs> it's just ready to not have it. Thanks again, Big Dan. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dan. Really appreciate you coming here tonight.